Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to a conversation on education funding policy here in the state of Vermont. My name is State Representative Emma mulvaney Sanic, and I am a Burlington state rep who represents a portion of the uh, Old North End and the New North End. I'm joined here tonight with a, several other co-hosts who are both state legislators and advocacy organizations interested in this issue. And uh, I'll be queuing up kind of the purpose of this meeting and then letting our co-hosts introduce themselves briefly. We're really excited folks are here tonight. We're recording on uh, CCTV, which we really appreciate so this information can get out further and wider um, as this impacts the whole state of Vermont. So very briefly, uh, besides the uh, streaming and recording, I wanna invite participants to leave their cameras on if they wish. Otherwise um, you can um, turn them on when you, when you speak later on in the discussion. We really wanna make sure this space is a space that's a one for dialogue and not debate and certainly one that's also safe. So the facilitator in me is going to share three really basic group uh, rules I'm gonna ask everyone to abide by as we um, engage tonight. And those three simple ones are um, to think first on who speaks first. This is one where I like to offer folks to think about that we live in a culture where some people in our community have been marginalized and devalued because of their identity. Whenever it's possible, um, please check in with yourself first and see if uh, and let the response first to a question or a prompt be from a person most impacted by oppression and bias in our culture. This includes youth, indigenous people, people of color, LGBTQ plus folks, women and gender non-conforming people. The second rule I ask folks to think about is that we are living in a Zoom life here. So here's a little technical stuff. Um, please use your raise hand function if you'd like to speak, especially when we get into the dialogue function and stay on mute so we can minimize distractions in the background noise. I mean, I, th I think everyone's pretty much memorized this at this point in 2021, but just a quick reminder. Um, and if the space becomes unsafe for any reason, if we have folks in here who are intending to disrupt, um, then we will remove those people from the room. But if the space is unsafe for you, I encourage you to turn your camera off, mute it, and we will, the facilitators of the space, make the room safe again and then let folks know with a broadcast message that you can come back in. Finally, the third one is please expect differences. This is a policy debate. There are strong opinions sometimes on issues and I ask people to listen to understand, not to debate or, or outmaneuver someone's comment that they shared. We are hoping to educate people to learn and to understand the nuance of this issue tonight. Sound good? I get to be a little dictator here and say, those are the rules, so thanks for playing. Okay, great. So uh, briefly, tonight's event, so Ed's funding in Vermont, education funding, we have one of the most equitable systems in this in the country, and we have one of the more complicated ones. So tonight's mission, Liz Curry, who is a wonderful constituent of mine here in Chittenden 6-2, and I began discussing, wouldn't it be great if we could try to help folks um, grapple with this issue and understand it a little bit more deeply? So our first goal tonight is to deepen your understanding of the education funding system. Our second one is to specifically focus on the emergency, emerging policy conversation around this with changes to the formula, formulas that inform the ed funding system. This includes um, concepts you might've heard, but like the per pupil weights, a categorical aid and the UVM study. These are just a few things floating out there that we'll talk about um, uh, tonight and also the task force that's been working this fall on this issue. The third and final piece is we want to make sure there's time for discussion and questions and insights from folks convened tonight, not only legislators, but all of you as Vermonters and how we go forward with this policy discussion, because legislators do better policy decision making when we hear from folks. So that is our purpose. Thanks for coming along. And now I'm gonna pass the mic just to introduce, have each of our co-hosts tonight introduce themselves. So we have a few state reps on tonight and also Rights and Democracy, and we'll introduce a couple more go guests in just a minute. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Tanya. Tanya, do you wanna come off and mute and introduce yourself? Absolutely, thank you so much. I am Representative Tanya Bihovsky. I am also a representative in Chittenden County. I am in Chittenden 8-2. Nope, I'm in 8-1. <laughs> And uh, that is Essex Town primarily with little bits of rural Essex and little bits of the village of Essex Junction. Um, and I'm really excited to be here to have this conversation um, as a social worker who actually works in schools and really sees the impact of the inequitable inequitability in our funding streams firsthand. Thanks, Tanya. Taylor. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Representative Taylor Small from the great city of Winooski, Chittenden 6-7, because I still do have the River Silver of Burlington, and also excited to be engaged in this conversation this evening, understanding the way that our pupil weights directly impact Winooski school districts and school districts that have English language learners predominantly. So looking forward to hearing uh, what everyone on the panel is going to bring forward. Thanks for hosting this, Emma. Yeah, thanks, Taylor. And Representative Brian Chino will be here in just a couple more minutes, um, has a work obligation and will be here soon. That's our other official legislator co-host. And then Dan, do you wanna speak just briefly of rights and democracy and who that organization is? Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, Dan Fingus, rights and democracy, um, Vermont organizing director, rights and democracy is a six-year-old member-based organization that works on social justice, climate justice, and education justice. And we're really excited to make sure that community members and parents' voices are included in these very complicated conversations, but very important conversations. And I appreciate being able to co-host this. Thanks, Dan. And we will hear very shortly from um, Stephanie Yu, who is from Public Assets Institute. So her introduction is gonna be in just a minute, as well as Liz Curry, um, not only one of my favorite constituents, but actually also a former school commissioner from here in Burlington um, in just a minute. So before that, just so I can officially pass the mic, I'm gonna provide a little bit of an oversight on Act 59, just for a few minutes. Uh, to help folks understand at home who haven't been in the legislature what that enabling legislation was around this task force, uh, enabling this task force to be in formation, and then a little bit of um, how those all come together. So this bill was a bill we passed in the 2021 session. Um, it, its purpose, and you can find this on their website, which I'll put into the chat in a few minutes. Um, the purpose of this uh, from the enabling legislation is to help the state uh, legislature Form, uh, for the, sorry, for the task force to form an action plan and propose legislation for the legislature to ensure that all public school students have equitable access to educational opportunities in the state of Vermont. And they are charged with making a set of recommendations on how any proposed legislation or this action plan by December 15th of this year, so right before the legislature reconvenes in January. Um, they were also directed to use elements of the UVM uh, per pupil weighting factor study, which was something that in 2019, the legislature funded and enabled um, to dive deeper into how we fund education today. I'll say a little bit more about the UVM study in just a minute. Uh, the task force has eight members on it. There are four senators and four state representatives and the committee membership is um, based on committee assignments, standing committee assignment from finance and tax committees and education committees on the house and Senate side. Um, sometimes I've been asked who made that decision. That appointment was made by the Speaker of the House and on the Senate side, the Senate Committee on Committees. That's how those, those folks were selected. Side note, since I am in Burlington and most folks um, who are co-hosting are from Burlington, or sorry, from Chittenden County, there are no Chittenden County members on this statewide task force. And I just make that point as a um, representative from this county who we have um, a handful of districts who really have a very diverse needs compared to others in the state, not to say we all have different needs, but it was an interesting choice just in terms of committee composition and perspective. So the legislature, as I mentioned before, in 2019 formed the, or uh, enabled uh, a study to be um, drafted, created, sorry, missing the verb there, but a, a, a study to be, um, well, I'll just skip over that. Cre they, they, they enabled and funded a, a study for the legislature um, to better understand the current funding formulas that, um, that are used to weight economic disadvantaged students, English language learners, secondary level students, which are high school students, um, for the purpose of calculating the equalized uh, per pupil figure. And whether or not Vermont really needed new or other factors to better inform that calculation. So that was the charge of this UVM um, per pupil weighted study. It was a per peer reviewed study um, done by more than just UVM professors and academics. So they released the study in late 2019. Um, and then a little thing called COVID hit. So the legislature actually wasn't able to do much with this study in the 2020 session. The major findings in this study was that the, per, the current per pupil weights are not based in strong evidence um, of, the need, of the current needs, the modern day needs of what it takes to educate students with these identities. So as I mentioned before, English language learners, um, economically disadvantaged students, um, and some other categories that, uh, that they noted in the study. They said updates were needed, and one in particular was adding a rural, a rural weighted factor um, for students who are in very rural districts in the state. 
Um, a couple more things I just want to say on this before I pass it over to Liz and Steph is the a current task force that's been meeting um, is charged with looking at the weighted um, calculations, looking at excess spending thresholds. These are some terms that probably Steph will mention again. Um, so it's not just the per pupil weights that they're looking at. I want folks to know that. So they're also looking at excess spending thresholds, yield calculations, and how categorical aid is used to help address differences across districts because states still have low, I'm sorry, um, districts still have local decision-making powers on how they, they move money. And they also are looking at how to better define these categories um, and when calculating equalized per pupil um, spending so that there's ba better basis for saying, why is, there, why is the weighted formula um, such for the folks who are um, uh, economic, economically disadvantaged, the kids from um, experiencing poverty or English language learners, that there's an actual rhyme to a reason on those calculations. Their last piece they're incorporating in 2018 was an act called Act 173, which made changes to the special education funding. Um, and so they're incorporating that into their work as well. So going forward, um, these are some of the policy considerations and challenges that we'll start to see in our conversation tonight. So we have districts in the state um, with very diverse needs like Burlington and Winooski who have a lower tax capacity than they need to fund what actually is needed for these students to be successful. So this is, might be a term folks have heard called underweighting. Um, so basically they, 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 um, there's an increased need, they need more services, more ability um, to raise money to order to really meet um, the needs of their, of their student populations. Other districts in other parts of the state have a lower tax base and a lower tax capacity to fund their schools. Um, and that's either because they have higher poverty rates or lower grand list values, et cetera, that go into their, um, what they are able to work with. And a change in the formula, uh, if we were to make policy changes could increase their tax capacity and it they could choose to lower their taxes, for example, for folks um, who are having trouble paying their tax bills or spend more on their local students. And then we have a third kind of general area where districts where um, districts are more homogenous with their student populations and may have adequate tax capacity to fund what their student needs most at this point. Um, and so they they might choose to do more or less, but there's really, you know, very, um, this is where all the differences really start to emerge around uh, different, different um, needs within uh, different school districts in Vermont. So the questions to throw out tonight really to start grappling with is how do we create equitable outcomes statewide with these differences, knowing we have such diverse needs across districts. And that truly, I hope everyone on the call tonight, um, we really are here for the equitable um, education and uh, successful outcomes for all students, no matter where they're going to school in Vermont. And how do we address the wide range of um, spending per, uh, the rate, uh, sorry, how do we address the wide range of spending per pupil across districts because the student populations vary so much? And then finally, because um, the whole system of education is a complex one. How do we find short-term solutions and opportunities while also looking at larger um, policy um, questions here about really looking at a more equitable way to raise money for education in the state of Vermont? The task force meets again for the public hearing on October 29th. And so if any of this is stuff that you wanna follow more deeply, again, I'll put a, the task force um, committee website into the chat and you can uh, participate in that next public hearing if you so choose. So thanks for coming to my TED talk that I hope I didn't get graded on that because that is a first term legislators attempt to try to talk about education funding and moving parts. And I'm sure Steph or Liz or other folks tonight will correct anything I didn't get 100% um, correct there. Um, but that was my attempt to get you up to speed on where Act 59 is at as quitting the task force. And so I'm going to pass it over to Liz Curry, um, a local neighbor who will take us into the next part of our, disc um, our information sharing. Hey everyone, thanks a lot for being here. And, um, you know, I really want to appreciate my representative, Emma, and the other representatives, all the legislators that are on this call, because um, I spent seven years on the Burlington School Board. And what became increasingly clear to me is that school board's hands are really tied by legislative action. Um, there have been an incredible number of changes to education funding um, over the past eight years with a lot of different acts this and acts that, ACT, not AFC, but we did have to acts <laughs> as a result of Act 46. So anyway, um, the, the legislative role is so huge, more than most other issues, the legislative role in 
you know, school funding is huge. That being said, there's this dynamic of maintaining local control. So um, that creates a lot of the tension and having legislators like Emma who are paying attention means that I think we get, ultimately we'll get better outcomes um, from conversations like this. There are very few people who can articulate the ed funding system in Vermont. Even if you know you could understand it intuitively, um, there are very few people. And Steph Yu is one of those. She's the deputy director of Public Assets Institute, um, which has focused. Uh, actually, the director was part of the architect of the original Act 60 um, or N68. So. Um, they are deeply steeped in education funding for Vermont, and Steph's background is in fiscal analysis for the public sector, financial analysis for the private sector. She's been in the executive branch of the Department of Treasury in another state, so um, she just brings a incredible amount of not only analytical knowledge, but ability to really um, break it down for us. So um, thank you, Steph, for being here tonight to do this, um, and we're really looking forward to understanding more thanks liz and thanks for that thanks for that introduction i always appreciate um conversations with you and other school board members from that for that perspective because i think it's easy to get sort of stuck at the state policy level and kind of forget what it looks like for the people actually implementing some of this stuff um i'm also a parent in the burlington school district i have a kid at iaa and a kid at hunt so you know i'm also looking at it from that perspective um, I, I'll try to make this not too Burlington centric, although I do have a little bit of information that's that's related to Burlington. Um, but, you know, this is sort of the quick version. There's a lot of details. As, as both Emma and Liz said, this is a complicated system and there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of detail. But I'll try to sort of hit the highlights. And I think the what we'll do is if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. And if not, we can kind of cover them in the discussion part of this. So I'm going to, I think I have the ability to share my screen. Let's see. I just have a few slides. Um, I think that hopefully are helpful. So let's see if that we can bring those up. All right. So a little bit about public assets briefly, which is um, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan fiscal policy think tank in Montpelier. As Liz said, we do a lot of work on, on education funding partly because it's really important, but also because it's sort of the biggest thing that the state does, right, in terms of, of dollars dedicated. So um, there's three things that I really want to try to do tonight. Here, here are the goals. Um, first, provide this quick overview of the funding system and, and talk about sort of the basic level of statewide equity that we achieved with Act 60 and 68. And that, that will include a little bit of a detour about the Burlington reassessment, because I think that sort of illustrates how people interact with the system and also sort of how any town when they reassess what sort of the impacts are on folks. And then the second thing is to really talk about how these cost adjustment tools work, the categorical aid piece and the pupil waiting piece. And then, and, and third, just briefly kind of touch on, I think Emma did a good job summing it up, but you know, sort of what the waiting study was, was uh, charged with doing. So when we talk about the, the school funding system, there's really, there's four main things that you know, that I want you to take away from this. The first thing, and, and for those of you who are familiar with Brigham, we always sort of put up a couple of Brigham quotes because I think they really kind of tell you what we're trying to accomplish with, with the system. But, um, but the first thing to know is that Vermont is one of only two states that has a statewide school tax system. And I don't think this, this really gets talked about enough because all resources are pooled into one big pot, which is the education fund. So there's three major uh, revenue sources for the education fund, residential school taxes, non-residential taxes, and then consumption taxes mostly, the, all the sales tax, a chunk of the meals and rooms tax, and then a few other odds and ends, including, um, excuse me, <coughs> including lottery, all the lottery proceeds. So I think whether or not it's a statewide system might not seem that important, but especially to the taxpayer who doesn't necessarily, necessarily care where the bill is coming from or, or who's billing them. But, but it's important for two reasons. The first thing is that all school districts are drawing on the state's non-residential property tax, all the state's non-residential property tax, which wasn't true before 1997. So it used to be that if you had commercial property or second homes in your town, you kept that revenue local, which was a big part of why there was so much disparity between wealthy towns and less wealthy towns. 
And the second thing I think to think about is that um, the second reason why the statewide funding system is important is because we're all collectively raising all the money for all of the kids. So school tax rates are set based on the total amount we need statewide. And then they're calibrated. And this is where I think a lot of this discussion is focused. They're calibrated so that each town's tax effort corresponds to its per pupil spending. So what that means is in Vermont, student funding is less dependent on the wealth of the community. So no town is funding its own schools through homestead taxes. We're all getting a mix of all of these revenues from the education funds, which has allowed us to achieve, to achieve this sort of, as, as Emma was saying, sort of a a much more equitable funding system than most states have, right? It's it's better than what we had 25 years ago and, and other states are sort of still in the phase of being sued by districts or being sued by students because their, their funding system seems unfair and isn't working for them. So so that's sort of the, the basic level of statewide equity that we talk about. All students are sharing all the resources and all resident taxpayers have to make the same, same effort, have the same tax rate to get the same per pupil spending. So we're taking this sort of statewide view in the interest of equity, recognizing that when we do leave things 100% local, the, dis the town to town disparities do tend to get pretty big. So that's the first thing, we have a statewide tax system. The second thing is that we have local control. And this is where I think Liz mentioned sort of this balancing act that we're, that we're trying to achieve. We're leaving the decisions about how much to spend and, how, and what to spend it on in the hands of communities. So we still have variations among districts. While we're all paying for all the kids, we trust each community to know best what, the, what it needs for its kids. So, so Vermont's funding system, unlike a lot of other states, supports whatever level of funding that voters choose. A lot of other states have a, have a foundation formula, which is essentially trying to get to a floor of spending. So the locals raise some money, then the state adds whatever aid it needs to aid to get you to sort of this floor of spending. It's a fixed amount. Vermont system supports whatever level of funding the voters choose, but residents of that district are, are paying higher taxes for higher per pupil spending. So second thing, that's local control. The third thing is that again, those rates for the residential slice of the, of the pot are determined each year. They change each year based on your per pupil spending that you decide on your budget on town meeting day. So towns with more per pupil spending, Towns with higher per people spending have higher tax rates. Those with lower per people spending have lower rates and those with the same have the same rates. It sounds simple, um, but it wasn't true before 1997, right? So before Act 60, you, had, you could have these high tax rates and not a lot of money to spend per pupil. Or you could have a low tax rate and a lot of money to spend per pupil and it just depended on the property wealth in your town. So it was sort of all over the place. But sec since Act 60, we've had this coherent relationship between per pupil spending and property taxes, right? So any town that's spending $15,000 per pupil is gonna have the same tax rate and it moves together. Higher, higher your spending, higher your tax rate. So, so you're getting the same payment from the Ed Fund for the same tax rate, regardless of how much you are as a town are contributing to the Ed Fund. For example, Burlington, 4,000 plus students, Roxbury, 88 students, both have the same tax rate. Clearly the amounts that we're contributing to the Ed Fund are different, but we're still getting the same amount in education payments and per people spending. So this is really a big step forward for students and taxpayers. The fourth thing is that resident taxpayers can pay their school taxes in one of two ways, either based on their property value or based on their, their income. And for most Vermonters, paying based on income is a better deal. But for those at the higher end of the income scale, paying based on property value is the cheaper op option. But regardless of how you pay, your taxes are moving up and down with your per people spend, your tax rates. So we're really trying to strike this balance between state and local control. We have a, a statewide pot, it's state taxes, but then there's this local control where local voters get to decide. And, and the towns still get to decide what to spend it on. And then residents have this, uh, um, choice between paying based on their home value or their income. So we do have to kind of dig into a little bit more of the details to sort of go over the Burlington reassessment piece. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do just, because this is what happens when any town reassesses, but I think Burlington felt particularly dramatic because there's a lot of people, because it had been 15 years. So I just sort of want to go through a little bit of, of what's happening there. 
So as I said, I live in Burlington. I experienced the reappraisal too. Um, we've, we've established that most residents are paying their, their school taxes based on income, but some are also paying based on property value. And there's some who kind of have a slice of each. So when the property value changes, their, their school tax bill will change. But I just wanna be clear that from the state's perspective, it's not 15 years, from a school tax perspective, right? It's not 15 years of changes in one go. Each year, the state is recalculating that fair market value of the total property in all Vermont towns. So what you're paying in school taxes is more or less keeping up with market changes, right? So it's not on the school tax piece of it. So the state is applying the school tax rate to what the state sees as the total fair market value in the town, whether Burlington or anywhere else. And that determines how much the town has to pay into the ed fund. So the state's been, up, been updating Burlington's aggregate property value all along, even though the actual assessed values of the properties are not, are not changing, so the, the on paper value is not changing. So then there's this technical fix that the town has to do. And again, this is true of all towns. The technical fix is that because the town is sending your bill based on your assessed value and not a fair market value amount, they're adjusting the tax rate to get the same amount of money that they would get if, um, if they were basing it on the fair market value rate. So this, so this is sort of a shorthand example. So if the state is saying that all of Burlington property is worth $100 million and the, and the tax rate is $1.50, then they're saying Burlington has to contribute $1.5 million to the ed fund. Obviously these numbers are not the right numbers, but you get the idea. So, but if the local assessed value is a total of 95 million, we still have to contribute 1.5 million. So we have to set a tax rate that gets us 1.5 million, right? So that ratio, the ratio of the assessed value to the fair market value is what we call the common level of appraisal or the CLA. And it varies from town to town, depending on when they last did an appraisal and, um, and how much property values have changed. And because Burlington had gone a pretty long time, 15 years, you know, that CLA had dropped to below 80%. So you see, so that's a big jump, I think, in a lot of the, in the difference between the assessed value and the fair market value. But again, our school tax bills have mostly been coming up, been keeping up with it. Except that the state is not changing the value of each individual property. It's just sort of estimating the overall change in the town. So when a town does a reappraisal, it's really, it's a truing up of the state and sort of a reestablishing the base value of each property. And what can happen and what did happen in Burlington is that not all properties increased in value by the same amount. So I'll give seven days credit for this great map, I think, and an interactive map. So you can go sort of look at all the neighborhoods and sort of street by street. And it shows the difference in growth in the different neighborhoods. So you can see how much it varied from area to area. So again, while that total amount that Burlington owed in school taxes to the Ed Fund might not have changed a lot, what, what individuals are paying what changed a lot. So again, the way the system works is that you pay based on whichever is better for you, your income or your property value. But there's also a few additional quirks in the system that are likely to increase the number of residents who have jumps in taxes. And this, I think, I think this is a particular problem in Burlington, but also in, you know, in some other towns in the state. So I hope that this table helps explain what, I, what, I, what these other quirks are. So what you're looking at is household income and house site value, and then what that means. So both of these pieces sort of come into play, your household income and your house site value. So for those with incomes under 90,000 and house values under 400,000, and those with incomes between 90,000 and about 137,000 and house values up to 225, they're only paying an income-based tax. That won't change. So a property reappraisal is not gonna change their taxes. For, for household incomes under 90,000, but house values over 400,000, and those incomes between 90,000 and 137 and a house value over 225, they're paying the income portion and a slight property portion based on the, what the amount of the value over that threshold. So whatever's over 400,000, you're paying a property tax piece. Then for household incomes over about, and this is Burlington specific numbers because the kind of tipping point varies based on the town because the, the tax rates vary town to town. So 
but it's but it's roughly around that 136 137,000. So over 136,000 give or take. No matter what your house site value is, you're paying all property based on your house site value. So so you can see how this create how the, these thresholds kind of create some additional groups that were particularly affected in Burlington. So Burlington's median household income is around 51,000. Although that includes renters, so it's probably so homeowners probably skew higher than that. But and the median house price, and these aren't final numbers because there's the appeal process is still happening. The median home price jumped from 237,000 to about 380,000. So you can see that there's like it's likely that there's gr a group under 90,000 who may have crossed that 400,000 threshold, or people with incomes between 90,000 and 137,000 who crossed that 225 threshold. And what that means is th both those groups are picking up a property tax portion of a bill that they'd never had before, that they didn't have to pay previously. So we don't, we couldn't get numbers because the Burlington, the public Burlington data had some problems. So we can't get numbers on how many households are in those groups, but I think there's, it's likely that there are households in those groups. And it might not be a huge difference, right? If your value is 401,000, you're only paying it on that 1,000. But if your house value jumped from 380 to 500, it's a pretty big jump. And, and I'm not even going to touch the municipal side of that because that's a whole other story. And I do recognize that you know, as a taxpayer in Burlington, that you, what you see on the bill reflects both of those pieces. So it can be hard to kind of keep those, those pieces separated. But that's how the school piece of it works. Um, and as an aside, all of this sort of complicated explanation of how the CLA works and how the property value piece works um, would be unnecessary if we got rid of the two parallel systems and just had an income entirely income based system, but that's a different conversation. So that's sort of the detour into the Burlington um, and, and really any town's reassessment of, of what happens. So I want to come back to the two cost adjustment tools, which I know is a lot of what people are interested in tonight. So we really think of this as the second level of equity. So on top of this sort of statewide level playing field, which is, you know, we all share the resources, we have this, this one big pot. Um, we have these two cost adjustment tools, categorical aid and people weights. And, and the purpose of those is to recognize these costs that differ from district to district that are out of district control. And so to sort of smooth that cost so that all districts have the resources they need for their kids, whatever those needs might be. And these tools really aren't meant to be static. They're meant to be responsive to changing needs and to be recalibrated as needed. So some, some quick definitions. Categorical aid is money for districts either for categories of specific costs or for categories of need, where weighting is used to adjust each district's pupil count, which impacts your per pupil spending and therefore your residential tax rates. So currently we use, I think somebody mentioned this, we use categorical aid for three things special education, transportation, and small schools. And I, I'm gonna sort of set aside a lot of the, the policy debate and, conf and complications around special ed funding and sort of talk about how it's mostly operated over the years. Similar to small school, the small schools grant, which also has been kind of in a, in a couple of years of upheaval over the last couple of years. So, but the idea is that transportation and special ed are reimbursement for specific costs, where small schools are sort of a category of need, right? So if your school qualifies, you get the money, you can do what, what you want with the money. Uh, and then the way that waiting works is that it's applied to these students in these, facing these different, in these different categories, as Emma said, English language learners, economic disadvantage, and then the, the grade levels. There's also pre-K are also weighted slightly less than one. So that's another piece too. But this is an, I hope this equation is something that we look at I think that sort of just helps people understand where the two different tools come into the process. So I'll walk you through this. Um, and and you, so, so we all vote on our school budgets on town meeting day. We approve a total budget, but that's not, the total budget is not what's setting our town's tax rates. We take, first we take these costs off the top, which include categorical aid and some other adjustments, federal, um, federal aid and a few other things. And so that leaves us with this sort of bottom part of the of the pie, um, which is the district's education spending. 
And this is where people, which is typically around 85% of the budget, although again, that varies from district to district because of how dependent they are on categorical aid or, or other things. But so this is where people waiting comes in. So we divide the education spending by the number of equalized pupils, which is the number of pupils um, after waiting adjustments are made and then equalized across the state. So that gives us each district's per pupil spending, which then gives us the, um, the, res the residential tax rates, both the income and the property rates. So per pupil spending is really a way of comparing apples to apples across districts. So how do the dis how does the district spending compare after you set aside the size of the district and the differences, the differences in need across the districts? So again, I, I think it's helpful to really think of these as two tools that we can use to make tweaks to the state level, statewide level, where we can sort of take this statewide look and, and try to smooth differences across, across districts while still leaving most of the decision about what to, how much to spend and what to spend it on at the local level. So I think um, Emma gave a pretty good overview of what the waiting study called for. I will just add, and again, this is sort of, you don't have to read all the language, but I think the, the point is, is that the waiting study has been a lot of the focus, but there were a couple other questions that were also raised in Act, 70, Act 173, as, as Emma noted, the special ed census grants. And then there's sort of this broad number two, which is methods other than per people waiting that, that could have an effect on quality and education and equity of educational outcomes. So, so that's really sort of the quick, the quick version of that. And I think part of the reason that Act 173 was sort of putting these things together is because there is a lot of interaction between among these things. And so I really felt, you know, wanted to look at the whole picture of special ed, um, kids facing poverty, English language learners sort of put, put it all together and see what that, that added up to. So again, I think Vermont has this very solid education funding system with sort of this baseline level of equity for students and taxpayers balanced with this local control has these two tools to make these tweaks as needed. And it is a complicated system. Um, and I think for, from my perspective, the critical finding of the waiting study is I think something that everybody agrees on, which is that there are kids, that we know there are kids that are not getting the resources that they need, right? And so that's something we need to fix. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to listen and participate as needed or take questions um, and listen to the rest of the discussion. But I'd also just point you, we do have a number of sort of kind of one pagers or graphics or different things about the education funding system on our website. And we also are working on this Vermont education equity project with Voices for Vermont's Children. So there's a website there as well that has resources if people are interested. And I, I, will, I haven't looked at the chat, so I'm happy to if questions came up or anything else. And Steph, no questions came up, um, at least for now. So I think we can pass it over to Liz. Thank you so much. I always really appreciate how graphic um, your presentations are to help explain all the moving parts. And I appreciated that last one in particular around the, the moving pie. I don't know, you probably have a cooler name for that graphic. So Liz, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Great, thanks. Um, and I just wanted to throw this up on the screen so people could actually see in Burlington the calculation that uh, Steph was referring to when looking at the 20 fiscal year 2020 budget or 21, I'm not sure, sorry. But essentially um, for Burlington, we had the education spending, which is as Steph said, less than our budget because we start with the total cost of delivering education and we deduct special ed grants, federal grants, EL federal grants and um, other things that I am not remembering. And so this is our education spending, which is what we get from the state ed fund. Our equalized per pupil count has been around 4,000, give or take less than 100 students for a long time, for like four or five years. Equalized people count, meaning that's not how many students are in the district. That's the number of students that fall into these buckets that get weighted. And so you end up with a higher count than actual bodies because some students have higher needs than others. And then you get the homestead dollar yield, which is a 
a calculation that um, mm. basically says this is what we need. I'm not even going to, like, that's one of those things I can't accurately um, define, but that's what we'll get from the state and determine our tax rate. This is the common level of appraisal that Steph was talking about. Um, we, sh all communities are assumed to be at 100% of appraised value based on the state um, tax um, assessment. They said you took all the property in the state and said it all should be at 100% of market value or appraised value. So states fall below, I mean, cities, municipalities fall below that when they don't reassess. And so the state formula makes up for that gap. And that's how you arrive at a tax rate um, that compensates for that. So that's kind of what it looks like in Burlington recently. Uh, so the, the only other things that I was gonna kind of just bring up are just those policy questions around what we're talking about um, in terms of pupil waiting versus categorical grants. And there's, um, you know, from my perspective, I plugged into this issue in 2018 when the original Act 173 was written that then directed the legislature to study the waiting formula. The waiting formula has been embedded in, in the um, education funding system since Act 1668. And so that is something we've grappled with for a long time and as well as categorical grants. So, you know, the policy question I have is which approach is in keeping with the intent of equity? And why does the answer change depending on whether you're in an urban or rural district? Um, so I think that just gives you an idea of like in terms of framing, um, many districts across the state um, have a different student, student body. Um, and so equity looks differently when you, when you are looking at a statewide picture. Um, in Burlington, it's our commissioner's job to represent our needs. So um, that is the local control piece. Each school board has to represent its district needs. And there's an element of parochialism in that. And then there's statewide actors who will look out at the state and look at equity differently. And that might be organizations like Rights and Democracy or PAI that might say, you know, we are concerned about equity for everyone and, and, and approaching it in a different way. So that's kind of where some of the tension comes into this conversation. So those of us that locally really want to advocate for what's going to work for our kids. And statewide, you're going to have districts that don't have our experience or our challenges, and they may have other experiences and challenges they have to solve. But the question is, which approach is in keeping with the intent of equity in the original funding system? Thanks, Liz. We have one question in the chat. And I also, before we move into the dialogue, I want to also just invite, um, I see one Burlington school commissioner, current school commissioner on. So in just a moment, I'm going to see if there's anything they would like to add locally. But Steph, I wonder if I can give this question to you. Um, Ruth asked, I'm curious about the non-residential tax rate, current use, and other similar exemptions. Um, not sure if those are the right terms. And, and around education tax reform. And so Ruth, I don't know if you wanna come off mute and ask more specifically about that, or if you're just wondering what those are and how those are at, in play. So, yeah, just wondering briefly about those things. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so I think those are really good questions. How do we decide what the tax base is and who pays what? Um, so I think, so there's a couple of, of additional provisions in the education funding system that I think are relevant. So, so first, let me start with just the reason that only the residential tax rates move with this per pupil spending is because those are the, those are the people voting on the budget. There might be somebody who owns non-residential property in Burlington who's also a resident in Burlington, but they're, they're voting because they're a resident in Burlington and that, that's why it affects them. So the way the non-residential piece works is that it's one flat statewide rate. Right, so, so all non-residential property is subject to the same rate statewide. And that doesn't vary because they're not voting on the school budgets, they don't get to decide. Those, those property owners don't get to decide if they wanna spend more or less on, on schools. So, so we just set a fixed rate. But the other piece of the funding system that affects this is that all of those pieces have to move proportionally together. So the income tax rate for residents, the property tax rate for residents and the non-residential property tax rates 
has to move together because the idea is that we can't just say, well, we want to spend some more money and we're going to put it all on the non-residential tax rate. The idea is that, you know, those pieces are sort of moving in conjunction. So if overall spending goes up, both those pieces have to go up proportionally. So I think, so it is, so there is this sort of tie in on the non-residential piece. Um, the, the current use piece and, you know, I, I think it's sort of the, the bigger question of sort of how do we value property? Who, how, who do we include in the, in the, um, in the tax base? And, you know, there has been some debate over, you know, so, so when we say non-residential, the definition of re the residential property, and, and I threw around this term house site, and I probably should have defined it because your house site is your house in contiguous two acres. So if you have land beyond that contiguous, beyond those contiguous two, two acres, you're paying a property tax based on that land. Now with your house site, 90% of your value is in that house in two acres piece. So if you have additional land beyond that, you're paying something else. Again, I don't want to get too, too deep into the details, but I think these are good questions. And I think the task force is, as, as Emma said, initially doing a good job thinking through, not just sort of what, how, how you change the weights or if you change the weights, but also what are the definitions and the terms that we're throwing around here? And, and to Liz's point, I would even go back further. Um, these weights were in place before Act 60 and nobody quite, you know, nobody quite knows where they came from. And I, and I will say, you know, one of the things that's interesting about sort of, and, and please cut me off, off if I'm talking too much, Emma, but the, but the, one of the things that's, unique about Vermont's system is because there's variable spending across districts, the weights apply to different numbers. Unlike in a foundation formula system, which is what we have in a lot of states, the, the weight is being applied to a fixed amount. So if you have a 0.25 weight for poverty, which many, which other, many other states do, a similar range, it's being applied to a fixed amount, as opposed to in Vermont, where it's being applied to a variable amount. So there's a lot of questions in there, but I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Steph. Steph. And I just want to say that as a new legislator, I've probably been through four to five different education funding sessions, and I'm still picking up pieces as I hear them. So I think one of the most important things as we grapple uh, on a statewide level about what changes do we do is to really make sure that Vermonters um, have all the, all the information they need to follow along and really feel informed about what, again, what how do we fund today's modern needs for students um, based on who's in the schools today and what the needs are today um, based on what we know. Um, Mike, I wasn't able to, to chat you because you're, you're calling in on a phone. Mike Fisher is one of the current school board members here in Burlington. And I just wanted to briefly just acknowledge you, um, Mike. And I do wanna move us into a dialogue with folks on the phone because, or, sorry, in the meeting shortly because they've been so patient and I want to make sure we hear from folks. So, but Mike, is there anything pressing from the Burlington side of things you just want to throw out there that Liz or others haven't mentioned yet? Um, I just want to thank you for, and, and the, re the other representatives for, for bringing this together. As anybody who's just diving into this can hear, it is, education funding is extremely complex. And, and I appreciate what Liz says about, we're all bringing our own perspectives to this. Um, and I think me personally, the complexity is part of the problem. And, and I appreciate the task force trying to look at this holistically, but every time we, we, we look at an aspect or someone looks at an aspect, it just adds more complexity to the conversation. And so that's part of the challenge is to make sense and look at it holistically as a whole as to, we, I think we agree, everyone is, who's been looking at it this, is that something needs to be fixed. There is, there's a fault in the system that the system is inequitable. And so looking at how to solve it in a way that makes sense for the entire state, I think is what we're all trying to do. Thanks, Mike, and thanks for being here. Um, really appreciate everyone's attendance. So we're gonna pass it, uh, the facilitation Mike over to Brian China, Representative Brian China, who represents another part of the Old North End, who agreed to facilitate the dialogue portion of this. So Brian, I'm gonna pass it over to you if you're ready. And uh, Brian's just gonna help just remind us um, that we want to have this be a dialogue, not a debate, and really just unearth people's thoughts on this. So Brian, I'm gonna pass it over to you just to help us guide us through our last bit of time together. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to quickly look at the 
just review the ground rules again. Emma, did you text them to me or email them to me? Email, oh, but I can read. Them. Yep, okay, I can read them, them over. You that's I do. I got okay. you. Don't worry. So right, just you read them, you know. then I'll, I'll put two questions out there for people to consider, and right. then I'll explain how I'm going to kind of manage the um, the order. So go ahead. Excellent. Great. Um, and reminder, folks can come off camera if they like when they speak or for the whole discussion. It'd be great to see people's faces, but it is challenge by choice. So the three very brief reminders about um, the group rules would consider who speaks first. So this is just a reminder of folks who um, have marginalized identities. Uh, it's great to make space for their participation first. Zoom live here. So raise your hand if you'd like to jump in and stay muted. Otherwise, you could also use the chat. And then finally, please expect differences in the policy debates and try to listen to understand versus debate the issue. All right, thank you. Um, so if you would like to um, say something, you can raise your hand. Um, you could raise your Zoom hand. You could raise your living flesh and blood hand. If you have a foam hand from an athletic game, you could wave it. You could wave a flag. Um, you could... Um, write in the chat that you want to speak if we don't see you. And if worse comes to worse and you're being totally ignored, um, you could say, I'm trying to raise my hand and no one's acknowledging me. So we'll do our best to keep track of that. Um, the best thing might be Zoom hands. And um, I, did I see a hand? No. All right. So there's two questions um, that I was asked to pose. You don't have to answer these. It's just sort of to, to sort of stimulate the discussion. Um, so the first one is that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Discuss. No, I'm kidding. That's an old Saturday Night Live joke. Um, what are ways to advance policy that uh, do not divide Vermont communities for those underweighted and those overweighted? What are ways to speak to the value of advancing policy that benefits equitable education outcomes for all students, knowing that that doesn't always mean the same dollar amount for each kid. So would anyone like to start? Is that Barb Wilson I see? Yes, okay, Barb Wilson, um, please, please go right ahead. Hi there, um, thank you so much for putting this on. Um, and Stephanie, your presentation was awesome. I, I, I'm learning more and more about the whole educational funding. Um, one of the concerns that I have as I follow the waiting study um, is that I think it could have, if implemented um, based on the report and the study, and I know the task force is looking at this and I have provided them comments as well, it could have unintended consequences um, because it does so much at the district level. So I happen to be part of a town, Shoreham, Vermont, who's part of Addison Central, where you have a more affluent town, Middlebury, and we yet have towns such as Shoreham, who basically have high poverty rates, um, and also have, um, actually, we've grown, you know, we've worked hard at getting people to come to our town. So we've actually grown 40% over the next several years. But we would actually lose a lot if the waiting study was implemented as I understand it. And we would actually lose our small school grant because we're in a more um, you know, um, wealthy district. Um, and, and I really get that we need to be more equitable how we spend the money. But I also think we also look, have to look at the social economic impacts of what might happen to some of our small schools. And I think it'll be a driver you know, to close those schools because they're gonna have less money um, available. And our middle school kids are on the bus an hour and a half um, already. And I can't imagine having our elementary kids having that same um, situation. And I, you know, so that's just a real concern I have. I would much rather see a more income tax-based um, kind of um, tax as well. Um, so anyway, just my two cents here. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. So I see that Representative Tanya Vihovsky's hand is raised, if you'd like to go next. Thank you, Representative Chena. Um, one of the things that the question raises for me, and Barb, actually your comment raises as well, is the importance of talking about these things 
together, you know, how we fund the system and how we spend the money as, as one issue. I am in Essex, which is a, what would be labeled a, an overweighted district. Although we also, the Essex Westford School District also has the Westford Elementary um, and Middle School, which is a K-8 school, it's one school, um, which is not as economically affluent as, as a lot of Essex is. So it's a similar struggle. And I remember talking to our school board chair who was feeling really stressed out about this and I, uh, this waiting study and what was it going to take away from our Essex students. And I think when we are able to talk about raising money in a more equitable way, we're able to talk about actually lifting everyone up. And we're able to talk about how do we give every Vermont student the access to the things that the students in Essex have. And so I think we have to really have this conversation as a holistic thing. Um, and we do, um, Stephanie pointed to it, to that as well. We do have bills in conversation around, you know, how do we move to a more equitable funding source? The reality is that our education system has been sort of systematically defunded and hasn't gotten adequate funding as a whole. And so we really need to talk about how we raise more to put more into the whole system as well. So I, I appreciate that what you brought up, Barb, with some of our small schools and the way districts have been pulled together in a way that may include more wealthy towns and less wealthy towns and more rural towns and really just thinking carefully about this. Yes, thank you. So next we have Allison Knott, followed by Mark, is it Schauber? Okay, go, go ahead, Allison. Sure, thanks for hosting. Um, so yeah, I am Allison Knott. I'm a Rutland City resident, a member of our Rutland City School Board, and also a member of the Vermont, Vermont Coalition for Student Equity. Um, we've been working hard. Uh, I think we probably came together almost over a year ago now in examining the results of the waiting study and the impacts it has. And um, one of the things that has amazed me is that this can benefit, we're not just talking about urban schools, we're not just talking about rural schools, poverty, the English language learners, um, schools from all around the state of Vermont can benefit from this. And I think where it's getting muddled up a bit is um, we're not discussing where the money is coming from. It's the waiting, what it does, it's how we divide the pie. If there's extra money they can get thrown at education, great, but we need to make sure that that money is going to meet the students' needs. And if you look at the waiting study and many other literature um, across the education field, there are students with much more significant needs and costs to educate. And those need to be addressed no matter where the money is coming from. And it's simply the weights provide an empiric formula for dividing the money. If we have the same money that we have now, it's still earmarking more based on need versus just flat numbers of students and places that have larger taxing capacities getting the same amount of money as places with less taxing capacities and larger needs. And um, so, you know, I have great concerns with categorical aid. If, you know, we have all this money this year, great, you know, throw it out there, but it's not a sustainable issue. And it is not something that is going to change as populations change and shift. Um, you know, certainly with the coalition, one of the amazing things that I've had is I obviously I've been on the Rutland City School Board for eight years and I've I've seen our population changes as the kids, you know, born into the opiate academic epidemic hit the schools and the challenges we have. But then being in the coalition, I was just amazed. I hear these other school struggles and I'm like, geez, maybe we don't have it that bad, or at least we're not dealing with this. And there's just a really broad spectrum that if, you know, there are weights for small schools and there are many small schools in the coalition that look to benefit from weighting implementation as well. Um, so I think it's really you know, the idea is we want it to be equitable, but also sustainable and something that is going to change with time and not just at the whims of, of grants. So those are those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Next, we have Mark Schauber. I, uh, first of all, thank you for hosting um, and facilitating this really important conversation. Um, my name is Mark Schauber. I'm the executive director for the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity. I'm also a school board member um, from Dover in the River Valleys Unified School District. 
Um, I, I just wanted to make two comments. Um, one, to, to kind of answer what um, Barb brought up um, in regards to the small schools grant, um, the recommended weights that the um, that were published by UVM and, and Rutgers in the report um, don't actually address the need at the district level. They address it at the school level. Um, the application is at the district level, uh, which is the way our funding system works these days, um, but the need is addressed at the school level. So um, a school in a larger district that, school, that would lose its small schools grant um, if the application was at the um, at the district level won't actually lose it because the district as a whole is going to receive weights for that school. Um, so I, I think the, the fear of the loss of the small schools grant, um, while it's um, out there and it's real, if the recommended weights aren't applied, um, if the recommendations are taken, um, then everybody's good to go. Um, the other thing I wanted to address, and Allison pretty much addressed this, was that um, our coalition is made up of districts from the north to the south, from the east to the west, um, uh, urban, rural. Um, I, I think we are all in this to bring equity to every student um, and every taxpayer in the state. Um, and I don't think that the, the divide between urban and rural um, is as great as, as it once was. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. I see Barb's hand is raised again. Barb, if you could just hold on a second and see if anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to go. I said a second, I'll give him five. I don't know how to raise my hand on Zoom, but I have a quick question. Thank you, Sinead. You did exactly what I said, which was feel free to yell out when there's a pause. And so that's why I did that. So thank you for modeling what I asked. So go ahead. And then I see Sarah Woodard, and then we'll come back to Barb, if that's okay, Barb. Um, go ahead, Sinead. Yeah, I am um, Rob Mulvaney Cynics intern. I'm learning a lot about kind of the education funding in Vermont. I'm originally from New York, from Long Island. And from where I grew up, we had a system where if you wanted your child to attend a different school district, you had to pay into that if you weren't in the tax zone. Um, I'm wondering if anybody knows if Vermont has that, and if they do, if a child from a different district can attend a different school, does that go into the per pupil weighting, or is it because they're paying into it, it doesn't count because those kids aren't in that district? If that makes sense, if it doesn't, I'm happy to clarify on what I mean. I see Allison's hand raised as a school board member. Does, do you have an answer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so in Vermont, it is there's school choice. So if you can apply from your district to go to another district and there's limits set on the number of students that can leave a district to keep them whole. So there's not enough of fluctuation change, but money does not follow the student and nor does the pupil count. So you don't get any money for the student and you don't get the pupil count. Thank you. Um, Sinead, do you have any follow-up to that or are you good? I think that is very interesting. I think it's great that kids don't have to pay to go to a different school district. However, I think it's interesting that that does not factor into their spending. Thanks for answering my question, Allison. I appreciate it. Sure thing. All right, thank you. So Sarah Woodard. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm kind of sitting in the dark. Um, <laughs> I have a headache. Um, and it's partly because of the school funding. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think my big question about this issue is that, you know, Burlington cut so drastically several years ago when we couldn't pass our local budget. And then in the years following that, and it really hurt our kids. And um, and so I'm like really relieved to see that the waiting study came out saying that it's inaccurate. But um, I think what I don't quite understand is why it's taking so long to implement it. I understand that COVID came up, but um, from my perspective, if it seems illegal because we're not 
we're not actually, we don't have an equitable system if the waiting set, if the weights are off. And so why, I guess, why is this even something to be discussed and legislated? Um, like why, why isn't it just fixed is my question. Does anybody want to answer that question or was it was it more of a rhetorical question? Did you want any answers from people or was it more of a rhetorical question? No, I really do want an answer because I, I know like in past years, our the senators and representatives for Burlington have basically said this, this idea that the weights are inaccurate is dead in the water because we're a city and it doesn't apply to most of the state and we won't be able to win over our legislators. And so I'm, and now I think it has more legs because the waiting study found that the rural communities also are, are inaccurately weighted, but I guess, um, I guess I feel a little impatient and I'm wondering if we can't bring the other legislators along and get the weights adjusted, is that so, legal? So is there any legislator who would like to speak to why they think, why, you know, to answer that question? No one's like jumping up. <laughs> try. Um, coming from a district that is overweighted, where the school board is really concerned about what their district would lose if we adjust these, I think that that can influence people, you know, representing those districts to stand, you know, there to support their constituents and their constituents are saying this would hurt me. Um, and so I think that that's part of the reason that there's been controversy around it. You know, I, I stand with you in that it is the right thing to do. And we do have to ensure that, that all of our students get access to an equitable education. And there are so many pieces along the way here that, that make that not what's happening. And while we may be the most equitable, you know, that doesn't mean we are doing everything we need to be doing for our students. And that's why I think that, you know, having this conversation, I will say when I, when I talked to, you know, my school board chair, who was hackle, you know, really worried about what the waiting study would mean for her district when we talked about, well, what if, you know, if we look at this as a bigger picture and we bring more money into that system, we can raise everyone up and, and implement the weights. I'm not suggesting we don't implement the weights. I just think there's a way of doing that, particularly if we change the larger funding model and bring more money into the system where nobody has to lose. I think too often we, we pit people against each other and that's why these things don't move. We say, well, if they get that, you're going to lose and so fight against it. But there is a way in which we can actually bring everyone along. But I think it takes some outside the box thinking and really looking at things in a, in a broader picture way, because we can implement the weights and ensure that everyone gets lifted up and no one has to lose, but we have to think differently. So I, I think that that's why it gets, it gets really stuck too. And it looks like Liz has more of an answer as well. All right. So we'll have, we'll, we'll uh, have Liz Curry um, speak to this question. And then does representative Mulvaney Stanek want to speak to this question? Only briefly because Sarah is one of my that's constituents. So so let, I feel like I got to shine. <laughs> that's <laughs> fine. So we'll, let's do that. And then we'll see if, uh, what Barb has to say at that point. Um, and then we're going to be near the end. So go ahead, um, Liz. Sure. So first I want to say that the um, the school board didn't actually cut years ago. We, we lost about 8% um, of our budget as a result of federal funds disappearing. The legislature passed Act 46, which prohibited communities from raising the taxes. And then there was a deficit. So it wasn't a cut, it was, there was the money that was there, $7 million used to be there wasn't there. In relation to the other question, I, I wanna just pose this to everyone because what's interesting about all of this legislation is that the legislature doesn't actually come and check whether you as a school district have spent your money based on these formulas. So in other words, all of this stuff says, we're gonna, we're gonna send you this amount of money because you've told us you need it, but there's no one actually coming along and saying, did you spend $20,000 per EL kid and $15,000 per white middle class kid who doesn't have a disparity? So that's, so the accountability piece yeah, is interesting good. because it doesn't, <laughs> sorry. Oh, someone was um, talking. So the accountability piece is at the local level. And these formulas um, try to 
equalize students across the state. They equalize them. The equity piece is, is a little bit of a different conversation. So those are just some conceptually, you know, it's very like, if you look at the testimony in the legislature right now, the Milton, um, I don't know if she's the superintendent or the, um, or an EL teacher or head of EL, but if you look at the legislature and the task force um, website and look at the testimony, the Milton people are advocating for categorical grants because they've experienced um, an increase in EL students from like, nine to, I don't know, they're projecting 30. And, and for whatever reason, categorical grants seem to make sense to them. And that, and that, and it's interesting to me when you look at the task force, what they're hearing, who they're hearing from, and then we ask why, and it's, and you would have to know a lot about their school district to know the way they take their total budget and allocate it. And the other thing you should know is that in Burlington, the school board has decided, as it has in past years, to allocate the budget based on an internal equity formula. So it's almost like you could take all this proposed weighting, and any school board is welcome to allocate their money that way now. The, 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 the legislation just requires that everybody use those formulas as a way to say, yes, we've equalized things across the state. All right, thanks, Liz. So I see um, we have Representative Mulvaney Stanek, and then I see someone who hasn't spoken yet, Douglas Corb. So go ahead, Emma. Thanks. Very briefly, just to throw a couple more concepts, because I think what this opportunity also presents us is to think more broadly about how we how we think about education in Vermont and an opportunity to think about systems and concepts that are no longer serving modern day Vermont. And, and I'm one, for example, that when we talk about real equity, um, around the, the concept of really thinking around local control and to Liz's point, like we, how do we make sure that money is spent that really impacts the kids that need, that need, you know, all the services or the programming that really would um, lead to their success, be it in a tiny little school or be it a nine e English language learners in the Northeast Kingdom or 500 in Burlington. And so I think we, it's time to start having bigger policy conversations, not to say there isn't some short-term stuff we can be doing around an income-based system, but also this, this concept of local control so that at the end of the day, we're educating all kids and we see our job as the taxpayers of Vermont, as taxpayers in one big system and not these individual um, small communities. I know it's a big task, but I think we'll never have true equity if we have these individual um, uh yeah, just these individual uh, decision-making points that, that create more and more differences. I want us to find like a commonality. So just some bigger policy thoughts. Thank you, um, Douglas Corp. Hi, uh, thanks for hosting this tonight. This is really great. I love talking about education funding. Uh, I'm from Marlboro. Uh, we're a district that's in the really far south of, uh, of all of you probably. Um, but we are a small schools grant recipient, and I felt like I just wanted to comment on that that area. Uh, it seems like a lot of people had some questions, but I think it's overall relative to that discussion of categorical aid, because we were heavily involved as a district in Act 46 uh, and maintaining that local control um, representative Mulvaney that you just spoke of. Um, but small schools grants at that time, it was sort of dangled, uh, a categorical aid piece was dangled sort of like a carrot in order for for districts to merge uh, and, and lose that local control and lose that governance that Vermonters, I think, hold so dear. Um, so I just wanted to be you know cautious about categorical league. And now we hear districts that are afraid of, quote, losing their small schools grant, uh, even though if we were to implement the weights, that that would not be true as as they were directed through the report. Um, but I also want to point a finger to the ESSER funds that came through for COVID. And if you stick with me here, ESSER funds were basically a one-shot influx of money to support schools through COVID. And in those uh, funds, it was also to pay people to oversee the distribution of ESSER funds. So the same thing uh, will probably happen through small schools, or sorry, through uh, categorical aid to fix this problem, is that you're going to be paying people to tick boxes, which is exactly the opposite of what Act 173 was doing was to build a census block grant to have more easy distribution of the funds. So if you're gonna put categorical aid back into play, you're basically doing the opposite of 173 in my opinion. And uh, I guess I'll just say that populations change, populations shift and numbers and censuses do the measuring there to, to adjust. 
with those numbers. So Marlboro is not going to be the same town it was 25 years from now, I think. Um, and I'm sure Burlington won't be either. So in order to do a, the proper, I think, adjustments, it should be an equation that does it for us and not, uh, I guess, groups of legislators sort of, you know, issuing up uh, definitions for us. But that's just my thoughts. Thank you, Douglas. So um, it's uh, just about time to wrap things up. Uh, I would like to give Barb Wilson a chance. You've been very patient and let others who haven't spoke um, more than uh, once yet go. So we'll let you have the last word and then I'm gonna hand it back to Representative Mulvaney Stanek. Thank you so much. And I you know, really appreciate Mark and Allison and you know, the comments you had on the small school grants but, and, and Douglas as well. But I actually went through the math um, and created some spreadsheets. And when I went through it for our particular school in our, the small schools in our district, we would lose the small schools grant. Um, whereas if the Middlebury was a little smaller, we wouldn't lose it. So I must be missing something, um, but I actually did all the math. You know, I kind of a spreadsheet, spreadsheet kind of person. Um, and dove down into it. So, um, you know, I'll look at it again, but it was totally my understanding when I went through the steps that we would lose it. Thank you, Barb. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining us in the discussion. And to wrap things up, we're gonna hear from Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanek. That implies that I have some great wise words of wisdom to distill <laughs> upon all of you to lead you into the evening, but uh, really just gratitude for you all being here and for really being in a space around dialogue and trying to really unearth all the different moving parts in the discussion. Uh, just a reminder, the task force has another public hearing on October 29th. It's something you can tune into thanks to the hybrid system in person if you're near Montpelier and wanna be there or via, via Zoom. Uh, they'll probably have a similar testimony system set up where there'll be information on that website I linked earlier. If you want to testify, you, you do have about two minutes. It is a very short amount of time, but you can also submit written comment to that task force as well. And uh, I, I will speak at least for the, the legislators on this call tonight. Um, please do reach out if you would like to have further dialogue. Do also reach out to your local reps if you haven't already, uh, just to make sure we can make, we're hearing from Vermonters from across the state and, and uh, really um, appreciate everyone's different you know, opinions and where they're coming from. Thanks so much to Stephu for presenting all this great information on the education funding system from public assets and rights and democracy for being a co-conspirator, if you will, of getting the word out about this event and all of you for tuning in from around the state. Really appreciate it. And I'll hang on for a minute as we wrap up and um, close out the room and close out the recording, but thanks so much. <laughs>